to you. I hope you're staying warm up there in Minnesota. I, you know, I, you get a lot of questions about whether you're running for office or what your next job's going to be, but apparently there's a position at ABC because Regis is stepping down. So perhaps that's something you might be interested in. Hey, I watched your interview with Chris Wallace on Sunday with great interest. I, I, I want to start with your local state issues first, because if you do run for the White House, this is what a lot of voters will look to. They'll look at your record. And, and Minnesota, last time I checked, has a $6 billion deficit. Now, I know the argument you made that you've never worked with the Republican legislature, but how do you convince people that you are truly a deficit hawk? that you will go after spending, that you will bring that number down. So we're not looking at 14 trillion anymore. Well, because I've done it, Bill, in Minnesota, I was governor for eight years. Every two years, which is our budget cycle, our budget was balanced as it's required to be in our state. When I leave office, as I leave office, the balance which, uh, budget which ends next summer is balanced. But for the two years after that, there's a projected $6 billion deficit. But here's the important thing. That projection assumes a 27% increase in state spending. That is ridiculous. That is preposterous. If you have spending anywhere in a reasonable range, there essentially is no deficit. So that is a hypothetical based on a ridiculous premise. And as to me being a deficit hawk, the 40-year spending average in my state was 21% every two years for 40 years. And I got that down to about 1% per year during my time as governor. There's only four governors in the country that got an A from the tough grading Cato Institute. And I was one of the four and the only one in the northern half but of the what, country. But what you argue so is that... I don't think there's any question about my spending yeah. credentials. What you argue is that the spending is on an autopilot. And I don't know how in the world you break that cycle. Because Illinois is not there's doing a, it. Is Minnesota ready to do it? Well, politicians, for the most part, will only make tough choices when their backs up or against the wall. And that's why this debt ceiling question that's going to be posed to the country and to the Congress in the coming weeks is an opportunity, not a crisis. That's what I mean by saying let's not raise it. Let's send the president a bill that takes away his false choice of saying you either raise the debt ceiling or we're going to default. You can direct that the, pay, the Treasury pay the bills in priority order, first of all getting the debt obligations paid, then the military and down, on, down the line, and then force the debate to be on those things that are within the discretion of the federal government. And if he signed a bill like that, there would be no default. There would be ample time for the debate. And then we could get to the heart of the matter, which is finally breaking up and fixing the Ponzi scheme, which is the United States federal government spending. The, the, the logic you employ, I think, pretty much goes along the lines of what we have heard from leading Republicans in the House from John Boehner and Eric Cantor. But what they are saying, the, uh, at the point that they diverge from you, is that they're going to have to raise the debt ceiling anyway. But they're only going to do it if they get certain spending cuts on behalf of Democrats. So that's where you put the feet to the fire. Would you agree to that? W w would that be the equivalent of calling them on the bluff? Well, my approach is a little different, Bill. It's to say don't raise the debt ceiling and then take the next step of sending the president a bill that sequences, directs the spending in priority order so there is no default. That there is enough cash flow in the United States federal government's intake of money to pay our outside creditors and our debt obligations. Uh, there's th so that you, you, issue you pay is being... China and you take care of our military and then right? what's and after that? And then you that? have the debate and as, as to the rest of the money, the intergovernmental accounts which owe each other money then you have the debate with more time on how you're going to restructure and fix and reduce that spending. And it can be done. And the only way it will be done is to force this kind of showdown. Well, you, you also argue, and you've said this repeatedly, that this debate on how to restructure is inevitable, whether it happens today or in a month from now or a year from now or two years from now which sounds an awful lot like a campaign policy in 2012 or a campaign argument. So, so, so today when you make this case here, I mean, this is, if you get in the ring in Iowa, New Hampshire, et cetera, this is how you will go about your campaign. It, it seems to me like this is your number one issue. Bring down the debt and the deficit. That's what voters are telling you and other people. And this will be your number one campaign issue. Do I have that right? Well, it's, it's, regardless of whether it's me or somebody else, this is the most important issue uh, facing the country. If we don't fix this and fix it relatively soon, Bill, it's going to take down you know, our economy from within. 
It is a Ponzi scheme. It is broken. It is not right versus left. It is a matter of eighth grade mathematics. Anybody can look at a chart and see our spending obligations, see the projections for revenues. They don't come close to lining up. They haven't lined up for a long time. We know the answers. They've all been white papered, think tank, seminared, speechified, jaw flapped to death. Now the question really is, do we have the courage and the fortitude to actually do it? And that's why this debt ceiling issue is not a crisis, it's an opportunity, right. because we can force the, the issue. Last question. Do you think the Republican leadership now in the House has that courage? I have a lot of confidence in John Boehner and Eric Cantor and the team that's leading the House and, and the Republican team overall. Uh, they know that they have to govern like they campaigned, and they campaigned saying they were going to fix this stuff, and I believe they will, and I'm going to root for them and cheer for them to do it. But I think there's a way to dial up the pressure here to get even more change than people believe is possible and, and avoid the default. It's a false premise for the president to say we're going to default. That's not the choice yeah. in front of us. That can be avoided and then have the debate on the other I issues. I just want to be clear. On that question, that's a yes. That's an affirmative. Do I hear it right? Which question? And your respect the, the, the House leadership now that's currently employed. Well, of course I respect the House leadership. I think John Boehner is going to be a great speaker. Tim Pawlenty, thank you for your time. We will okay, speak again. You, I get the hunch many, many times over the next two years. Uh, thank you. Tim Pawlenty is the former governor okay, there thank you. in Minnesota. Okay, 10 minutes before the hour.